Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 678. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 6, 2021. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. This is the news program of Anglicanism and Christianity and secular news. George and I sit down here every week, uh, sometimes twice a week, and pontificate upon what we see in the news, stories that are posted on Anglican.inc and other news sources. Kind of fun. We've been doing this now for 10 years. A uh, little background, because I see there's lots of new subscribers. My name is Kevin, and uh, I own a company in Connecticut, and I run Anglican TV Ministries. I also live full-time with my wife in an RV. We travel around the country here in North America. We are currently docked somewhere outside of Madison, Wisconsin, kind of my hometown. George is a wonderful priest in the Diocese of Central Florida. He's in Lacanto, Florida, and he runs one of the most successful churches in his diocese. You've been there almost five or six years now, George, right? If I'm doing my math correct. Seven going on eight. Oh my gosh, George. That deserves a sip of coffee. Seven going on eight years. And so uh, this is a show we put together and uh, we love doing it. And this is the part in the show that I ask viewers to click the like button because that helps fool Facebook and YouTube into thinking this is a real good show and they will promote it for us. It's free advertising. If you have not subscribed to the show yet, please subscribe. If you want to be part of the conversation, a part of what happens here on camera, please go to the comment section and add your comments. We read all of them. We enjoy that you comment. If you do not want to watch our pasty faces on a video format, we have this in podcast only format. You can find that in the YouTube show notes. George, how are you doing this week? I'm uh, excited, traumatized simultaneously because a miracle, I think, occurred on Sunday. And I'm not being facetious when I say that. Sunday uh, early evening, my wife and I got a text message from our daughter, Laura, saying that Claudia had fallen while climbing. The two, my two daughters are out in California and they were actually spent the weekend climbing uh, mountains. And Claudia fell and that she's in the emergency room with Claudia. And over time we got the drips and drabs and of the messages and Susan told us, uh, Laura told us what was going on. The story was they were climbing and Laura had rappelled down a 60 foot cliff face and Claudia was following her down and as she was Maybe a quarter of the way down, the rope snapped. And so Claudia plunged. She had a free fall about 20 feet onto uh, an outcropping and then rolled down the remaining 40 feet to the base of the uh, ravine. And Laura thought that she'd been killed because, you know, 60 feet is a huge sure. place. And Claudia was alive and uh, she split her lip and her legs and arms were all scratched from the slide and they took she took and she and some other climbers helped claudia climb out of the ravine drove to the emergency room no broken bones no internal injuries she didn't rupture her spleen she didn't crush her skull she didn't split her neck break her neck she didn't she just it's all the things had, that dads think about when they hear that there's all the things that, yeah. Yeah, and she didn't even break her iPhone screen. <laughs> That's the first thing she was worried about. You were worried about her. She was worried about her iPhone. <sighs> and I really do feel that this is God's providence at work because by all rights, even if she didn't, she fell 20 feet, even if she didn't tumble another 40, she should have broken something or cracked her skull opener. And so God has uh, protected her, and uh, I give thanks and glory for that. But I'm still traumatized. <laughs> Goes my little baby girl. I, and I wonder where do they get this from, Kevin? I wouldn't be caught dead on the side of a mountain. You, uh, would, you and I would be huffing and puffing just to get outside of the visitor parking area. And our kids, they they have this, we got to have an experience mentality. And uh, your kids didn't bring the ropes. Right? Did, were they repelling on their own ropes or they just saw a rope and they no. said, oh. 
there was yeah. a there's a rope there's a rope hanging down the side of a mountain oh, yeah <laughs> just like <laughs> but i mean what can you and the thing is our children don't really talk to us on telephones anymore no. it's only for um, only when they need money and a crisis do they call the rest of these these sort of cryptic text messages with all these emojis and everything i mean man has progressed from hieroglyphics to writing and now we're going back down into hieroglyphics again um well i i have a new standard for reaching out to my children and making sure they contact me and say tell me how they're doing so i'll change the netflix netflix password which <laughs> is just as usual. that's that's just saying i want my attention and oh dad how are you by the way, what's the new Netflix password? And all three will do that within a day. So they're all watching too much Netflix, but they finally uh, will. Now I, sometimes they'll text mom, did dad change the password? Yes, he did. He wants his hot low text. He wants his, uh, we're checking up and we love you, dad. It's a whole new age, George. <laughs> now, I say this because I am the son visiting my parents back here in Madison. And mom and dad have been locked in all of COVID. They live in a nice retirement center here in Middleton on the uh, northwest side of uh, Madison. And the retirement center had no cases of COVID because they locked it down. You were not allowed in or out. You weren't allowed any visitors. You were allowed mask. Your health care providers, uh, nurses, aides and stuff could come and go, but they had to be fully masked. And mom and dad haven't been to a restaurant. They haven't been out anywhere in more than a year i show up post COVID, kind of and i got delta going on and i'm taking them to restaurants i'm taking them to tourist things we went to the wisconsin dells we took the duck boats where you get in a boat that's uh, amphibious and that was a lot of fun and so basically my mom and dad who are in their 80s have worn jill and i out we both slept in this morning because mom and dad have taken us or made us take them everywhere and uh, Wisconsin has been well touristed by Jim and Pat Coulson. Uh, so I'm here another week and I'll probably be worn out. It is what it is, but uh, glad mom and dad are doing well. Let's move on to the news. We got lots of stories. George and I had a discussion about, in, in our pre-show, we do about a half hour pre-show. What's the good news story this week? There was not a lot of good news going on. It's, it's crazy times, but we found one. And George and I, our first idea was there's a priest who sewed his lips together in protest of the media not covering climate change. That's priest sewn lips. That's a good news story. He won't talk or uh, uh, pontificate on non-godly things for a while. But George found a better one. There is a um, whistleblower a uh, priest in a diocese in the Church of England, I don't know why we talk about the Church of England so much, who now has his job back, so to speak. His name is Stephen Kurtz. Give us the update, George. Stephen Kurtz is the uh, is the minister, the rector, the vicar of uh, Christ Church, New Malden, in the Diocese of Southwark. It's, pronounced, it's spelled Southwark uh, for American viewers. Yeah. And on June 22nd, he was suspended by the diocese. And the reason why he was suspended uh, was, frankly, in my view, appalling. He has been trying to get the diocese and the national church's attention to a safeguarding issue, an abuse issue, for several years, or I'm sorry, for a long time. I don't know how long. And the diocese has ignored him. He wrote up a memo and circulated this memo to some close friends where he laid out his problem of the diocese ignoring the abuse and the diocese then pounced because he went out to safe he went outside of the safeguarding uh protocols and he mentioned somebody's name in this uh a memo that he was trying to help people help him with and he was suspended for violating safeguarding rules for, and essentially he was suspended for being a whistleblower well this past week the diocese of southwark uh ended the suspension and gave him a slap on the wrist for writing the memo and basically uh, washing the dirty linen in public. So we'll see if the Diocese of Southwark actually now moves upon the issues that underlie all this. But evidently this whistleblower has now been exonerated from the dreadful attacks by the diocesan drones 
uh, who are covering up things. It's interesting because right now here in America, we have a good example of a diocese in the uh, ACNA that did not follow procedure uh, in this type of situation. And it is just a mess right now where we're trying to pick up the pieces. Over there, they're still not following procedure as well. He was he filed with the diocese and said this is a problem. They never investigated. He tried to get the attention of the national church. They never investigated. And so we have a problem that is not being taken care of when there are procedures to do so. And it's hard to watch this in the church. You know, if if you're not going to be transparent, if you're not going to follow your uh, jobs and your rules, what's the point of having a diocese and a bishop and all the uh, uh, mechanisms and canons that go with it? Humble opinion. Okay, we alluded to another Church of England story that was almost our good news story. And I'm going to bring it up here on the screen for you guys to see because we can do that here. Uh, priest sews lips shut in protest over press responsibility in climate crisis. Now, I would say he's only <laughs> mad at Rupert Murdoch because the BBC has no trouble reporting all the weird news of climate change. But this is an interesting story because this is a, an activist priest who has uh, decided to do the real thing. He really sold his lips together, George. I saw the video. It's disgusting. Um, and he's just going to be a social justice warrior and a climate change person, once again, ignoring the gospel. Tell me a little about the story, and George. The Reverend Tim Hewis, 71, retired priest of the Church of England, had went to the headquarters of News Corp in London, and with a, and in front of the building, you can see the video, he, so, he sewed his own lips shut and then sat down in front of News Corp with a sign saying Rupert Murdoch ignores science and words to essentially that the News Corp and its subsidiaries are not uh, proclaiming the climate emergency that Mr. Hewis believes is upon us. And, you know, I, I think it's sort of sad that uh, at once upon a time, Buddhist monks would set themselves in fi on fire in Vietnam to protest mm -hmm. the war. And that made that every TV channel and was a constant meme for a year. This doesn't e even make the front page of the local paper in London because these sort of stunts are so passe and they don't accomplish anything. Do you think I don't even think Rupert Murdoch even knows this happened. No. Uh, well, it's interesting. I remember, you know, back in the 80s, uh, Jesse Jackson would have a hunger strike uh, outside on the Capitol steps. He'd have a little tent, and the pizza delivery guy knew where the tent was. Um, and he would have this hunger strike. And after a while, the press got on that he wasn't really starving himself. He was getting good nourishment. And people in the press can see through uh, fake... Uh, uh, protest and they stop covering you the, the Church of England has been a 60 year fake protest and they don't get coverage at all in the BBC or news uh, the BBC never calls a bishop anymore for comment would you please comment on the story we have in, in the secular press nobody cares about the church anymore and when they see this they don't they don't care anymore this is this is we get this from our secular people I could see Greta Thorn uh, Thorn I can't pronounce the last name Greta, I only have to use her first name, doing the same, and she would get press coverage more than this priest, George. It's a shame because uh, maiming yourself, I don't think, achieves anything. No. And also his message is so screwy. We spoke last week about the prophets of doom, Al Gore, Prince Charles, and their ilk, that we only have 12 years left. You know, Going back to the population bomb people in the 70s, the end is near, the end is nigh. And of course, uh, it's not true, it never happens. Um, I'm not saying there isn't man-made climate change. I'm just not on board with these people who say the end is two, three years from now. Um, and one of the things I've always cautioned people when in church settings, like at diocesan or parish events, well, let's do something to catch the press's attention. I'm sorry, that doesn't work anymore. 
short of taking a gun and shooting somebody, it doesn't catch as people's attention because people, the secular world is not interested in what the church has to say on secular issues. They're interested in what the church has to say about moral issues. And yes, I know climate change is a moral issue for some people, but that doesn't count. Um, we're talking about Christian issues. Um, well, and I so churches that waste their time protesting about immigration and climate change, nobody cares. Nobody I remember, cares. you know, Christians also used to preach the end of the world too, not just climate change, but uh, the late great planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. You know, Christians are not innocent in in trying to to get attention and find a way forward to uh, be in the press and have their message out there that the world is over, the world is ending. Uh, I think Hal Lindsey said it was the last generation. Well, yeah, <laughs> that, that's passed on. You know, and I'm going to say that climate change. You know, now that the, the world is cooling a little, uh, they're losing their muster. Uh, the press is losing interest watching all the Lear jets head off to uh, Sweden for these conferences. Uh, the press is fully into the liberal garb. It's fully into all these uh, uh, leading edge left ideas, but they, they don't want to be played. They want real news in it. And so if you can't provide it, you're not going to, you're going to end up on page six of the telegraph. Okay, George, let's hit our next story. What do we have here? Oh, boy. Oh, Kenya. Boy. Yeah, Kenya. Um, we talked about a woman bishop being consecrated in South Sudan. We've talked about another uh, bishop being voted in as a suffragan in Kenya. We now have another woman bishop being uh, elected, Rose Okino uh, in Kenya. And I see a problem for Gafcon. You see a problem for Gafcon. I thought we could talk about the story and talk about the ramifications. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, inside baseball mm -hmm. uh, for how the angle, you know, really what lies behind the scenes here. So, um, Rosa Cano was elected on Saturday, last Saturday, Bishop of Butere, which is a diocese in Western Kenya, a small diocese. And she, the, this election was presided over by the Bishop of Bondo. And the Diocese of Bondo was where Emily Oyango was elected a suffragan in January. And in 2018, the Gafcon primates passed a moratorium saying, we as archbishops of our provinces will not permit the ordination of bishop women to the Episcopal. One of the uh, signers was the bishop, Archbishop of Kenya. Uh, and a quick reminder, there was always an unofficial agreement that, you know, we're not going to have women bishops. You know, some uh, provinces are more than welcome to have uh, women in, in the clergy and deacon roles, um, but we're not going to tackle this women bishop uh, thing for a while. And maybe you never have to. Well, it's here now, George. Yes, and Bishop Professor Stephen Knoll uh, was part of a very wide-ranging task force that looked at women's orders. And the task force concluded that uh, while priests and deacons are acceptable across most of GAFCON, we're not of one line on women bishops. Mm -hmm. And this all was prompted, uh, the high-level task force, because in December 31st, 2016, a woman was elect, uh, consecrated as a suffragan in South Sudan. Well, the GAFCON primates got together and they said they wouldn't do this again until everybody was on board. Well, January turns around comes around this past year, and a woman is elected suffragan. And Jackson Oli Sapit, who has publicly endorsed the women bishop moratorium, told his synod this recently, uh, did not stand in the way of her being consecrated. And if you look at the recent picture on Anglican Inc. of the meeting of the House of Bishops of Kenya, where they gave a national pastoral letter, Emily Oyango is in the front row. She's the one with the purse and a skirt. Um, the issue now is, will he consecrate uh, Rose Kano? Gafcon primates have asked him not to, and he has said he won't. But here's the rub. The, uh, the issue is, the Kenyan church constitution 
uh, allows women bishops. And in 2019, the 2019 meeting of the Kenyan Synod said we reaffirm our belief in women bishops because we, right now, um, the grammar of men traditionally has applied to men and women, but we want to clarify this, that men does not exclude women uh, from the Episcopacy. So uh, Emily Oyango is uh, elected, and so Jackson Oli Sabbat has a problem. First problem is these the people who elected Emily Oyango are his opponents within the Kenyan church. That's right. There's a portion of the Kenyan church that's very tightly tied into the Anglican Church of Canada and the American Episcopal Church and Trinity Wall Street, places like that. They're the one. Uh, they're the ones. Uh, they're the opposition. Second, they're tribal divisions. This is Western Kenya. I think it's significant that Raleigh Odinga, who's the leader of the opposition to the president of Kenya, President Kenyatta, uh, immediately issued his congratulations to Emily. They're the same tribe. The against and uh, Kenya a number of years ago had almost almost was on the verge of tribal civil war for the elections. Jackson Oli Sapit is not of the largest Kikuyu tribe, as were his predecessors. He is a Maasai, which is a smaller tribe, and so he doesn't have the immediate tribal loyalty his predecessors have. And then, finally, the lawyers got involved, and the chancellors in Kenya say, look, you don't have legal standing to refuse these women consecration because the, the because that would be an act of discrimination that violates our church canons. Your private promise to have a moratorium is no good when it comes against the canons of the Kenyan church because Gafcon doesn't have a position of canonical standing on obedience. So Jackson only said is faced. So basically they got over January by saying she's a suffragan. She's not a diocesan bishop. She's not going to be exercising jurisdiction. Now the issue has been forced once again by the same people. Now, Emily, let's let's take Rose Okeno, the, the woman out of this. Mm -hmm. She's been a parish priest for 20 years. She's been the archdeacon. She's been the vicar general of the diocese following the retirement of the previous bishop. She's well qualified. She, you know, she's a widow. Uh, she basically is an excellent candidate for a bishop if you put sex to one side. Um, so what does Jackson Oli Sapit do? Does he give legal ammunition to the people who, within his house of bishops who want to tear him down? Does he follow the GAFCON moratorium? So we called GAFCON. And GAFCON sort of shocked us. They have a new press spokesman who's in England. Andrew Gross is no longer the GAFCON spokesman. And the new press spokesman said, well, there was a sunset clause on the women bishops moratorium. It expired in 2019. What? Said, what? What? <laughs> yeah, what? and I wrote him back saying, are you sure? Because that's news to me. He said, yes, we're sure. And, the, and then he went on to say the Gafcon primates have not been able to get together because of COVID, and they're supposed to meet in September in person. And we'll sort of see what happens when we have that meeting. So, in essence, GAFCON is backtracking. There's now a sunset cl sunset uh, on this moratorium. So the moratorium they agreed to in 2018 was a one-year moratorium. I did not know that. I didn't see that written down anywhere. Uh, and then the primates I spoke to acknowledged it as a one-year uh, I, I understood it as a journalist to be a, a moratorium until we discuss it further. And are of one mind. Yes. So I'm, I don't know. So I can see where Jackson Oli Sapit is. Mm -hmm. He's got to fight. He has disloyal bishops. Uh, these, they're, they're, some of them are going to go to get, uh, Lambeth when uh 2022 when uh, jackson said he's not going in solidarity with gafcon and if anybody wants to google lasaka in england unscripted we've discussed the bad bishops of kenya before one of them is a bishop of nairobi but mm -hmm. we, we digress um so what happens now well 
Gafcon has to decide, do we basically give Jackson all these a break because he's facing an internal civil war? And if we stay hard on this issue, he could be badly damaged and we lose him on other issues. Uh, there's a political calculus that has to take place among the leaders of the GAFCON movement. How, and I think we're sort of seeing it with this now sunset clause business, that, uh, that we're going to let things slide. That's what seems to be happening. But yeah. I, don't, I, I can't read minds. I don't know what the future will tell. Yeah, I do know that the primates have met by Zoom the GAFCON primates uh, over COVID during COVID time. So we'll have to see what happens. Um, interesting developments. And uh, I don't think it's a the ultimate test for GAFCON. GAFCON uh, can survive this, but it's just going to be interesting to see how they uh, put their new thoughts. Please put it on paper so we can refer to it in the future. Uh, uh, anything that has sunset clauses, we'd like to know. Uh, George, let's move on to some more news. You and I have, part of our, the success of Anglican Scripted is a dying global church. It's sad to watch uh, um, the Roman Catholic Church uh, lose membership, the Lutheran Church, the Episcopal Church, the United Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Southern Baptist. Now, you named denomination after denomination over the last 10, 20, 30 almost 40 years, have seen declines of anywhere between 25% to probably 60% for some denominations. And it's a global tre uh, trend where the church itself is identifying more with the world and more with culture. And people say, well, I, I get this from CNN. Why would I want to go to church to get it preached to me? And people don't see the gospel anymore in church. They don't see a difference between church and society. And times are changing. Kids don't go to church like their parents went to church. My generation didn't go to church like my parents' generation went to church. We, we don't suffer from the farmlands uh, of the Midwest where there was famine and drought and and all the things that would cause people to go into church and worship and pray and uh, have close connections with community. The community now is online. The community right now is uh, in, in this little rectangle device you carry around. Uh, you have apps called Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and, oh, mommy mealed, and uh, e email and stuff. And, you know, we, we found a different identity in ourselves through electronics. So I'm not surprised when I see a report from the Bishop of the Diocese of Vermont saying in the last 10 years, they've declined 25% and they're about to go into the red, George. We've seen this with other Episcopal dioceses. We've seen this in dioceses that aren't Episcopalian all over the world. The, the churches are going into the red, people aren't attending and people no longer have a need for God. There's certain parts of the country that are more God's country in the sense of the climate of relig religiosity is stronger. Certainly is strong here in Florida where I am. It's not Miami, but it here in the north and central Florida is. New England is very stony ground for almost all Christian groups. Uh, there are a few exceptions of mega churches, but uh, New England, we'll look at the Episcopal Church in particular, has been a constant decline. Um, the Diocese of Vermont elected a new bishop, Sharon McVean Brown. She's an African-American. She's the first woman, first African-American bishop of Vermont. And Vermont has 40, uh, congregation, uh, 45 congregations. However, the average Sunday attendance is 40 per congregation. And Sh Sharon, uh, Shannon, excuse me, Shannon, uh, Bishop, Bishop Shannon, uh, brought in an auditor from uh, an, uh, somebody from the accounting firm Deloitte, uh, who basically crunched the numbers and ran the books. And, and the report that they found, they released, which she shared at her diocesan synod in a pastoral letter dated July 22nd, was that uh, in 2023, we're going to hit a financial cliff. It's on the horizon. 
where income is going to fall below uh, expenses and no no amount of uh, cost cutting of uh, staff or uh, programs is going to cover it. Now the average per person giving is increasing each year but it's the demographic decline. People are dying and they're not being replaced. And Bishop uh, Shannon uh, is saying I salute her for basically facing this front and center and saying we've got to do something and the things that we're going to do is we're immediately going to be cutting costs we're going to have to look at how we structure parishes we're going to have to look at how we're uh she's doing the right things financially now my argument is that this is all rearranging the deck chairs on the titanic because they don't they're not doing things right spiritually uh, it's easy for me to say that coming from florida uh where times are good here Mm -hmm. uh, before COVID, times were good here, uh, but well, I, but what you're saying is very important because I want to see an experiment where the church actually says, "Why don't we return to the gospel and see if that works? Why don't we preach Jesus and see if that works? Why don't we reach out to the children and the young adults and the adolescents who are, have identity crisis?" Who don't know their gender, who don't know how to, to get an education, whose families are broken, and reach out to them with Jesus. And, and why don't we try that? Let's, let's try something radical and something new. Why not and not just rearrange the deck chairs, not just lay off staff, not just say the it's inevitable with an average age of sixty nine that this church is going to be extinct in ten years. No, let's let's do the inevitable and preach Jesus. Well, the problem I see, as I see it, is that uh, they don't have the right clergy to do that. Mm -hmm. They have clergy that match the ages of their congregations, or they, oh, and they have a lot of second career people who come into the ministry in their late fifties, and you know they've semi-retired to Vermont. Maybe a spouse works, but the hard work of attracting families with young children, of attracting the unreached, is really too hard for priests in their fifth like in their 60s mm -hmm. to start doing if they spent all their life just sort of tending the machine so in other words they've got the wrong they've got the diocese of vermont is fortunate that 10 percent of their budget is funded by investments they've got inherited money so they have some assets they have 45 churches which is wonderful for a tiny state but they, the other necessary asset, the human capital, is missing. They don't have the troops on the ground to advance the, the uh, agenda that Kevin has, has shared. It's just, in other words, you can throw, you can throw, actually, if they had all the money in the world, they still wouldn't be able to turn things around until they change the message and, and the people sharing the message. Yeah. So, I. Uh... I, I, if you're not going to change your message, I, I don't know what to say. You know, yeah, you're, you're going to go into the red, and we've seen this in other dioceses in the Episcopal Church. And one day you're going to run out of the trust funds. You're going to run out of the uh, uh, funds at your churches, like the Episcopal Church, the Diocese of Connecticut. Yeah, I don't know. George, let's move on, do some updated stories. Uh, Truro, we got an update from the vestry. What's going on there? Sunday is the parish meeting. Uh, at the parish meeting, uh, we've covered the forced resignation of Tim Mayfield, who was the associate rector and acting rector following the resignation of uh, Tory Balcom. And the, there's been pushback by some members of the congregation against getting rid of uh, Tim Mayfield. And the diocese, I'm sorry, the parish laid out a six point letter to the congregation basically saying we did everything right. Some people have complained that none of the other clergy were involved in this and they would all vouch for Tim. And the parish responded, well, it's not the clergy's business. We've been working closely with Bishop Guernsey. It's the vestry's job, not the other clergy's job. Um, many of the things that we shared in last week's uh, show where we basically said you know it's a difficult situation but the parish and the diocese have done it right 
they echoed in their letter in greater detail. You can read the letter on Anglican Inc. Um, and they also announced uh, that Mary Maggard Hayes, Mary Hayes, would be the new interim rector. Now, that's, uh, that's going to be controversial uh, for some people. She doesn't have the parish experience, really, that you would hope for for, for leading a, a, one of the flagship parishes, but she's in the interim, she's not the rector. And, of course, the women issue is going to pop up for some people as well. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure in that diocese, but, you know, maybe. Well, I think because it, those big parishes, Truro, Falls Church, Christ Church, Plano, mm -hmm. because of their status within Get Acna as sort of the cardinal parishes, that's why they get all this attention. And sure. so people outside of the diocese, outside of the parish, are going to, want their opinions to be known, even though they really don't <laughs> much matter to the vestry of uh, Truro Parish. Like Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> All right, so that's a Truro update. I see that we posted a story that there's uh, some candidates for Bishop Coadjutor in South Carolina. Um, cool. Uh, it's you know a, a great functioning diocese. It's been through so much turmoil this last dozen years. Um, and it's nice to see that uh, they're at the point they need a, a bishop co-juder. Um, faces I've seen around the, the the diocese are on the list. Should be fun. I've got a, a political story from Africa I'd like to share if you're interested in that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. In I fact, I, I'm looking here at the clock. We are at 36 minutes. we got 10 minutes to go. Go for it. Well, there may be time. Can I talk about India? Okay, never no, mind. No, um, I'm sorry. For those with a memory, in the 1960s, there was a terrible civil war in Nigeria called the Biafran War, where the southeastern Igbo regions, Igbo-speaking regions, wished to succeed, secede from Nigeria. That's where all the oil is, and the Igbo, Igbo people were basically upset that the northern Muslim Hausa generals were basically taking all the money that come at, came out of the ground and using it for them and not putting it back into the region. The Civil War cost hundreds of thousands of lives, both in conflict and in starvation, and it was settled with the defeat of the Biafran forces. Mm -hmm. I think it was like a million people died there. Close yeah. to it. I mean, yeah. the, these are one of those things that you just don't know, yeah. uh, the final total. Well, the... Uh, Archbishop of Enugu, uh, Emmanuel Chukwuma, uh, is in trouble with the Biafran separatists. This is the archbishop for that region. And now Emmanuel Chukwuma is a bit of a character. I can remember at Lambeth 1998, in front of the BBC cameras, he attempted to exercise the demon of homosexuality from Richard Kirker, the head of the gay and lesbian Christian movement. It should didn't be noted work. for the record that didn't work. Didn't work. <laughs> And he reminds me, uh, he always wears aviator glasses mm -hmm. with his uh, Beretta and uh, purple cassock. He reminds me of a South Vietnamese Air Force general. He really does. The only, the only thing missing is a cigar holder, cigarette holder, and an open top limousine. Um, the, there's a group called IPOP, Indigenous People of Biafra. It is a group that is agitating for the secession of the Biafra region, it's the inheritors of the Biafran Civil War. Their leader, Namidi Kuna, was essentially kidnapped from a foreign country by Nigerian security forces and brought back to Nigeria recently to stand trial for treason, for advocating independence for Biafra. IPOB went on to social media and accused Bishop Chuck Wuma of betraying uh, Kanu to the police of being part of the scheme to snatch him from a foreign country. And so IPOB has posted on social media uh, all these threats against Chuck Wuma and the Anglican Church in that part of the world. And we might see Archbishop Chuck Wuma murdered. Now, he's gone on to the record saying, I have had nothing to do with this. In fact, I've been a supporter of IPOB's nonviolent agitations. 
uh, and he has been a supporter for the Igbo people rights as opposed to the Hausa and other uh, Yoruba. Um, but politics is a difficult, dirty game in Africa. And I have no knowledge whether it's true or not that he was involved helping the federal government crack down on separatists, but the separatists think so, and they may kill him. Yeah, it's a not a pleasant story, and yeah, that that happens in Africa and other nations frequently. I see on our list we also talk about the uh, Uganda worship band. Band, no, band, not band. Band, B-A-N, uh, where uh, to fight COVID, they have really cut down on people gathering together, and certainly they've shut down the um, Islamic worship. They've shut down the Jewish worship and the Christian worship and said, we don't want to spread COVID this way. They've been taken to court. What is the results, George? Uganda has entered the 21st century, where when you don't like something, you sue. sue. Yeah. Uh, the Alliance Defense... Uh, Alliance Defense International, which is this sort of uh, International Religious Freedom Foundation, is helping some Ugandan churches uh, and mosques sue the Ugandan government for the draconian COVID laws. Uh, Uganda basically has been shut down uh, for public worship uh, with religion deemed non-essential. And they are responding by going to the courts to have the uh, judiciary overturned the president's decrees. If they're successful, that would be, now let's put a COVID to one side. If they're successful, that would be a wonderful thing because it would show that there are three equal parts of government, uh, legislature, judiciary, and the presidency, which is not the norm in Africa. Most times the president is boss and everything else flows from his will. So we'll see how this turns out. Um, it does seem excessive, the, uh, the the degree of the lockdown they have. It's not like Sydney, Aust I think it's Sydney, uh, I'm sorry, it, not like uh, Melbourne, where I'm told that they're having the police, the army assist the police in forcing COVID uh, stay-at-home orders, which is just ludicrous yeah, I, in I my mind. I saw a story that they have helicopters in the sky. Uh, down there trying to make sure that people don't leave their houses in groups and like you know okay we went through that crazy a year ago but uh, COVID is crazy we have Delta running amok here in the Midwest I know you have it in Florida it, um, I I remember eight episodes ago I gave the all clear I had my vaccination you had your vaccination we were out of this we were out of the woods life could return to normal people could go back to their jobs people could go back to their work sites people could gather again and have family reunions and class reunions and weddings and the world would start to be normal again that was eight weeks ago now it's shut down and uh, they're threatening to to have us wear a mask again i'm not wearing a mask again i, I burned my mask uh, don't see the yeah, we have here. we have new instructions from our diocese, diocesan bishop, uh, mm -hmm. asking us to wear, asking for the priest to wear a mask when he celebrates the Eucharist. Um, we've not uh, we've interpreted uh, the bishop's rules for lay people rather loosely, essentially saying, "Here's what the bishop says, but it is your choice." But being clergy, we are. Uh, we must follow the bishop's directives. No, um, you're Episcopalian. You have pastoral oversight, <laughs> which can over... I, I've seen it happen many times in the Episcopal Church in the last 12 years. You're allowed to overrule some of the strangeness of your bishop by having pastoral oversight. Well, I am a man under obedience, Kevin, and it, uh, it, it basically doesn't matter whether I agree with him or not. Uh, that's part of what you sign up for when you become an Episcopal priest of being a yeah, yes there are times when you need to take a moral stance mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that's wrong but for me the mask issue is not on par with some of the other issues that have led to the formation of the ACNA and other groups <laughs> it's not the hill you're going to die on no, no it's not. all right well we've hit uh what 
45 minutes. You guys have been very patient with this episode of Anglican Scripted. I, I do want to thank George. You know, he's put a lot of time in. He's a very successful priest. He's doing it right. His church is growing. And twice a week, he sits down with Kevin and we talk about the news. But that's not the hardest part of the job. The hardest part of the job is finding the news. He's a journalist, journalist, and he's always posting news stories on Anglican.inc. Please go there if you've never heard of Anglican.inc. It's on the web. I'll post an, uh, a link in the show notes. And when you get there, it's going to ask, do you want to subscribe? Do you want to get updates every time there's a new story? Just click yes. And then every time George posts a new story, whether it's his own or a press release, you will know what's going on in the Anglican communion. That's what we do. Can can I mention just two, two little things? For some readers, uh, we first off, I do want to say I had a bit of a thrill, and I know Kevin did too, that one of our our story on Rowan Williams, which we covered in Anglican Unscripted last week. The Greta was story? Picked up, the Greta story was picked up by the American Spectator magazine. And one of their authors wrote an extended piece giving us credit and uh, drawing upon it for his uh, opinion article, which was a bit of a thrill for me. Sure. And he linked to the story, and so that that one story has sort of a lopsided viewership compared to some of the other stuff. But what I wanted to mention is that the Church Society put out a press release about uh, their bullying complaints against them. Uh, the Andreevs, uh, Michael, and uh, just went out of my head, his wife, have uh, accused them of bullying, and there's been a long, simmering conflict there. And I received an email from uh, some of our readers saying, why did you not challenge some of the assertions in the press release? Well, and, and, and the, press 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 says, release. the press release says, we did an investigation, we found ourselves innocent. And we're getting yeah. a bit of a pushback on that. Yeah, and that first off, you know, the name of the author is it's clearly listed. It's not me. It's mm -hmm. titled a press release. And I mean, I've put up things by Colin Coward from the Gay and Lesbian Christian Movement. We don't, uh, not everything we post represents our point of view. Far from it. Uh, but w what we try to do is put out everything so that you can read it for yourself. And to the Andreevs who objected, and to the supporters of the Andreevs who objected to the Church Society's press release, I said, send me yours, yeah. and it'll go up as well. So uh, I think people have been trained in the recent years not to think anymore and when they read. And so everything you get on CNN or on MSNBC or Fox presents one point of view. Anglican Inc. tries its best impartial. Uh, which means uh, allowing both sides to speak their minds so they recognize their points of view and what's being said. And that's why we put a lot of credence on press releases because, you know, what's the point of rewriting? For instance, the Bishop of Vermont's letter is up on Anglican Inc. where she talks about the financial cliff and everything. It's better for you as an intelligent reader to read what she says than to rely solely on my condensing it into 50 words. If you want the 50 words, you listen to Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do 25. You do 25. It's, it's a good system. It works. No, I mean, th there's a lot of benefit to having the conversation and being very transparent. When we post uh, stuff that we disagree with, we post it because we know that you can read through that as well. You're an intelligent audience. Um, we know because you watch us. That's... Yeah. And we also post things that are not complimentary to us. Uh, mm -hmm. The Bishop Derek Jones wrote some rejoinders to our mm -hmm. coverage sure. of uh, the uh, JAFC chaplaincy controversy. Mm -hmm. um, and we published his responses, Absolutely. which uh, were not things that uh, made us look good. He disagreed strongly with what we had to say. Mm -hmm. But it's still important that we put out what Bishop Jones's point was. Absolutely. All right, we've covered all the bases. This is Friday. This is a weekend. Get out there, have fun. But on Sunday morning, worship. And all don't climb days, mountains on Sunday. Don't instead. climb mountains. Pray. And bring your own ropes. Bring your own ropes. Don't rely on other people's ropes when you're rappelling down a mountain. <sighs> Please don't. I'm Kevin Carlson. 
And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 678 of Anglican Unscripted.